Hi everyone. Uh, we're so excited to hear to be here with you to be able to chat about this book, Color by Number: Understanding Racism Through Facts and Stats on Children. And uh, I thank Lakuho so much for this opportunity. Uh, to give you a little bit more background information on me so that you could understand where I come from uh, in, in doing this work. Uh, I, I love the idea of being able to do this work with Glacujo because my career started in the residence halls. Uh, my undergraduate degree is from Eastern Illinois University where I did uh, a bachelor's degree in psychology and of course uh, was an RA during that experience and absolutely loved uh, my time as an RA. For those of you that are very committed or connected to the Glacujo region, you might uh, uh, find it interesting to note that if, if you happen to know who Jody Stone is, Jody's the one who actually hired me to be an RA and so it's uh, both uh, his his fault, uh, and uh, uh, and it's great to be able to still stay connected with him and Eastern all these years later. After my degree at Eastern, I went to Loyola University where I did a master's in counseling, continued working in the residence halls as a, a, a graduate hall director and then as a residence director. Came here to DePaul a little more than 10 years ago where I served as a residence director did a second master's degree in multicultural communication, and then went back to Loyola for my doctorate in higher ed. I've been here in the Dean of Students office for about seven, eight years, uh, serving as assistant dean uh, and then being promoted to dean back in 2011. But along the way, I've done a lot of diversity and social justice training, and this is where uh, the link with Kokuho really comes, is that uh, the first diversity session that I ever did in my career was at a Kokuho conference. I was actually trying to think think back to the year, I, I want to say it was uh, 2001 or maybe even the year 2000. Um, and I was joking around with some of the uh, folks uh, leading up the session that had that not gone well, I might have just stopped there. But uh, I was really pleased with the response of the conversations at Kokuho and it, it can, and it pushed me to continue going forward and wanting to put together more opportunities to, to talk and learn about diversity and social justice, ultimately leading me here to talking about this work, Color by Number. So to give you a little bit of background on the work of the premise of it and why I wrote it. You know, my primary topic that I talk about is race and racism. Um, I, I speak a lot about white identity development, about white privilege, about whiteness. And it's continually surprising to me the amount of energy that needs to be devoted to still convincing people that racism, racism even still exists. It's actually been compounded by the fact, honestly, since the election of Barack Obama. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with some of the colorblind rhetoric that is being uh, put out there uh, into the cosmos, this whole idea that now that we have a black man, or more specifically a biracial man that, that has assumed the presidency, that race is no longer the impediment that it once was to advancement. Uh, that is something that I would ardently um, argue against, that the success of one person does not undo systemic racism. But still, it's been something put out there a lot that I'm, I'm surprised, again, just at the number of people that continually find it difficult to talk about the ever-present reality of racism today. And so I wanted to put together a resource that compiled the facts and stats to be able to show uh, where racism it is and, and how it continues to be chronic and pervasive in society. I wanted it to be a helpful addition to educators and activists because you know, it's, it's remarkable, actually, as you look at the field of people that do diversity and social justice uh, work, we are surprisingly, with the way we teach, remarkably homogeneous in that we teach from a story-based um, pedagogy. Now, for me, honestly, that's how I resonate. That is, for me, uh, what helps me learn. At my heart, I'll always be a counselor. But when we all teach from the same uh, praxis, we typically then will only reach learners that are similar to us already. Well, what happens to the people that are different? How do we expand our ability to reach different types of learning styles? There are some folks that the quantitative approach of the show me the numbers is going to be what gets through to them. And so I wanted to make this resource to challenge the field a little bit to it just expand the way in which we talk about and advocate for diversity and social justice. Now there's a couple um, uh, parts of symbolism to this idea of color by number uh, and the reason why I called the book this. Uh, the first is that I want to talk about the varying ways that racism interconnects throughout our life. Uh, here in the academy in higher education, we can sometimes be remarkably siloed where researchers and advocates and allies only know one in-depth topic. 
uh, they know a lot about health care or environmental justice or juvenile justice or K-12 education or higher ed, but very often we're not talking about the interconnections amongst all of these. And here in the field of student affairs, we talk about the holistic person. Well, this is understanding the holistic person. We have to understand every part of their story and how it interacts and intersects with uh, how race and racism has affected our lives. There's one other last part of uh, symbolism to the color by number before I actually get into some of the substance of the book. And that is, this book is about children. And honestly, it was something that I struggled with when I was writing this book about you know, deciding who the book was going to be about. Uh, my life's work is with adults, it's with college students. And so a lot of people might be surprised that I wrote about a book about children. But the reason why uh, was twofold. First, I wanted to be able to thwart the common mythology that gets put out there about the American dream. And I'm sure many of you have heard about this before. And, and that mythology is, if you work hard enough, you can achieve anything in this country. Um, that is something that I would ardently argue against. However, the folks that would put forth that ideology, um, they have some reasons to be able to believe what they believe. You know, there is a certain amount of work that adults can do that they can sometimes change their life station. Now, there's a lot of things that get in the way. but you know, there is some credence to that argument. However, if we're talking about children, that argument can't be used at all. What kind of work do we expect of an eight-year-old that is going to improve their health care access or is going to improve the school that they're mandated to go to because of their address? Children experience a protected class in our society. And if we can show systemically how racism affects them from 0 to 18, what do we, think, what do we magically think happens when they become an adult at 18 years old? This is something that systemically affects us throughout our lives, and we need to talk openly and honestly about it. And so the color by number idea was based on that children's game that maybe some of you played uh, when you were young like I did, uh, where you color in all the number ones green and all the number twos blue and all the number threes purple. And when you, after you do that, you can see this greater image emerge. And I think when we put together this color by number game on race and racism, we can see a greater image. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how we can make some of those interconnections here today. Now I'm going to talk through some of the information on uh, color by number, but I look forward to you know uh, more towards the end of this presentation or at any time if you want to interrupt, please do. Uh, questions that you have and how we can make use of this as we advocate for diversity and justice issues uh, on our college campuses. So divide, uh, diving right in, the first chapter is called Preventing Medicine, uh, Healthcare Access. This is probably going to be the chapter I talk about the least, only because uh, it actually overlaps a lot with the next chapter where I'll be bringing up uh, topics about health insurance and healthcare access. But uh, healthcare is something that has gotten a lot of press, especially in recent years. And we know children um, uh, experience uh, a, a lack of insurance. And we can see this you know, through some of these statistics of being uninsured presently or uninsured for part of the year or some of the present year. Uh, but we know children of color are the ones that experience this to disproportionate high amounts. And we can see some of these statistics here where for Hispanic children, it is literally one in five children uh, lack health insurance. Now, one thing I always like to point out when we start talking about facts and stats is how they can be used and abused. Uh, and I've seen people do this before. Um, you know, some people will look at these numbers, and if they wanted to make the point that children of color are not disproportionately hurt, they could drop the percentages and say, look, 3.4 million Hispanic children and 3.4 million white children both lack health insurance. So you know it's about the same. But obviously we have to look at this within the greater landscape of the United States. And with whites being the majority, this is heavily disproportionate, especially as we look at Hispanic children. And when we know children are uninsured, um, they delay seeking treatment more than insured children, and then sometimes are unable to receive treatment. This is going to be really important, especially as we get into our next conversation that links to asthma here in a moment. So getting into that next conversation, the second chapter is Race, Space, and Place, Environmental Justice. For those of us who advocate for diversity and social justice, environmental justice is actually a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention, and I would recommend to all of you, you look into it. It's a uh, um, a really interesting topic area and one that literally touches everyone. Environmental justice as a field is the study and advocacy for the fact that um, people of color and the poor 
are the most likely to experience the highest degrees of pollution throughout their life experience. So people of color and the poor are the most likely to experience that high degree of pollution and what kind of effect that has on their life. The best way to try and dive in and understand some of these topics is through some case studies. And, and so I've devised a few of those for us to talk about. This first one centers on this substance that's on your screen right now. It's called carbon black powder. It is a fine, fibrous material that can easily become airborne and cover a great distance. It's used in making flame retardant materials, tires. Uh, it's used in making paints. It's a magic material. It's used in all these different types of things. Uh, but the most important thing is that it, it, it can become airborne and cover a vast array of land. This is Ponca City, Oklahoma. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, um, a square, a blue square, right here where my cursor is. This is Continental Carbon Black, a business that produces carbon black powder. And we can see up here at the top of the screen where my cursor is, Ponca City proper. Ponca City is a predominantly white community, and all of these little triangles are the schools that are in the community. Right here where my cursor is, you can see this rough dividing line, and this is the Osage Indian Reservation. And you can see one school right over here on the Indian Reservation. Continental Carbon Black has been sued repeatedly by the Ponca City residents in the north. And Continental Carbon Black has had to pay reparations time and time again to those residents because of the effect this carbon black powder has had on this community. There are stories of children having to go to school wearing gas masks uh, because of the powder being so pervasive in, in the community. Uh, family members you can't open up the windows to your house depending on the wind is blowing because if you open up the windows the entire inside of your house is going to be coated with this carbon black powder uh, that is a carcinogen and can do awful destruction uh, to the human body when breathed in or ingested. There are many families that live on the floorboards of their house because it is just way too difficult to keep carpeting clean. However, for the Indian Reservation and that one school uh, on that Indian Reservation, to this date, not one single lawsuit has upheld that the Indian Reservation deserves any reparations from Continental Carbon Black. But the Ponca City residents who are predominantly white in the north have won several. Another example here is Texarkana. And you can see in the, the bigger map up, on, uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, it's literally right on the border of both Texas and Arkansas. Uh, Texarkana was created uh, about four or five decades ago, about five decades ago, to be a intentionally created African-American city. Now, that might sound crazy, uh, but we also have to put within the context that at the time this was created, it was perfectly legal to create segregated communities. So this was created as an African-American city. It was built on top of what are called Superfund sites. And you can see those three Superfund sites right in the middle of the city, right in the middle of the city. The Superfund site is a designation by the EPA that says it is land that is particularly toxic to humans. This was built right on where Texarkana is. Now, after decades and decades of lawsuits and instigation and advocacy, finally the US government stepped in and said, OK, you know, we were wrong. We should not have built this town here and paid reparations to all the individuals that lived there. There would be some environmental justice advocates that would say, this is a success. It took more than four decades. What kind of damage was done to the families that lived there for those four decades? And there would be many people that would also say, well, why didn't those families just leave? Why didn't they just leave Texarkana if they knew that it was so harmful? I think the, the difficult thing that we all have to wrap our hearts and minds around is that if you are a middle class or a lower class family, your home is the biggest investment you have in your life. How do you just walk away from that, let alone the community, let alone this is where your schools and your family and your churches are. This is literally the home you own. If you walk away from it, you literally have nothing. And that was the position the Texarkana residents were put in for decades. As a uh, final example, I think this is the final case study in this uh, uh, section. Uh, throughout the book, uh, because I am a uh, lifelong Chicago resident, uh, I tried to bring in Chicago examples whenever I could. And sadly, if you're talking about race and racism, that is not a difficult thing to do. Um, this is a neighborhood on the south side of the city called Altgeld Gardens. Altgeld is a predominantly African American, predominantly low income community. Um, you can see these red dots all over the screen. Those red dots are hazardous waste sites as delineated by the Environmental Protection Agency, by the EPA. 
I want you to look at where some of these red dot sites are. Look really closely. I'm going to put my cursor over them. This is Aldridge Elementary School. This is Scanlon School, Carver Middle School, Carver Primary School, Carver High School. These are all Chicago public schools. Children are in these schools right now, today, attending classes, continuing their education, and this is where the hazardous waste sites are with where they are going to school. I want you to focus right here where my cursor is for a moment, where Carver Primary School is. This is, a car this is a picture of Carver. This is where these children are today. I want you to take a moment and look at this photo. Where is the hazardous waste? And the answer is, it's everything that you're seeing here. It's on the swing set. It's in the grass. It's in the air. It's on the buildings. It's on those, car it's on those concrete posts. It's in that gravel in the foreground. That's the most dangerous thing when we talk about hazardous waste is that you can't actually see it. I think that we all envision, you know, this green bubbling gook that, you know, comes up from the earth. But the most dangerous thing about this hazardous waste is that you can't see it. But there are children in this school right now uh, going to school just steps away from an area that the Environmental Protection Agency has said is hazardous waste. Now, what kind of effect does this have? One that we can talk about is the asthma prevalence rate. And we can see throughout time the asthma prevalence rate has increased. This is the raw numbers, but this is an easier way to look at it. This is the increase in asthma-related death starting in 1979. And we can see for African Americans when compared to whites that from 1979 to 2006, that increase for African Americans has been 103%, whereas for whites it is 19%. We can see for children, the child mortality rate for African American children is much higher than it is for white children. You know, this is one place that I want to start talking about some of those interconnections. I'm a lifelong asthma sufferer. Uh, it's something that I've dealt with my, in my life. I can remember going to the hospital when I was a child. I can remember breathing in the nebulizer. I have my, uh, uh, my puffer just not five feet away from me where I am right now. I've had access to health care throughout my entire life, though. When you don't have access to health care and you are living in an area with increased pollution, you are more likely to have asthma and then less likely to be able to get assistance with it. And then with that, that means for children of color in general and then specifically here with African American children, they're away from it. I mean, that is one way we can draw one set of connections throughout all of these uh, topics. One other set of connections while it skips ahead a little bit that I want to be able to uh, bring in now, is that children who are diagnosed with asthma are nearly twice as likely to also be diagnosed with a learning disability. I think that's a really interesting covariance, and there are, is a lot of research out there that, that calls into under suspicion as to why that is. Is it that these children are more likely to have learning disabilities, or is it they are more likely to have sleepless nights? they're more likely to have their sleep disturbed because you can't breathe. And when your sleep is disturbed, how do you perform in school the next day? And if teachers are seeing this systemically of your poor performance, it might be easier to say, well, they must have a learning disability, which is why they're falling behind, when it might be asthma is the reason. For the next topic, criminals or children, juvenile justice. This is a topic that I was really interested in diving into. I'm the son of a Chicago police officer, and so I find uh, the topics about the justice system to be really just intriguing. And as I was, uh, as I was putting together this uh, chapter, I found myself focusing a lot on the Lady Justice statue. And something really finally struck me with it that stood out. And I just want to take a minute and kind of unpack some of the symbolism to the statue. First, we have this Lady Justice statue who is blindfolded. And the symbolism is supposed to be, you know, justice is blind. And then also with holding the weighted scales is all are equal uh, before the law. Now, I would ardently argue against both of those ideas. But let's skip over those for a minute, OK? She's blindfolded. She's holding these scales. Justice is blind. All are equal before the law. Lady Justice statues often are also holding a sword. And the sword is meant to symbolize the retribution and punishment that is also associated with the justice system. This is where, ironically, I find that this is an incredibly apt metaphor. Does it stand out as odd to anyone else 
that we have blindfolded someone, given them a sword, and told, yes, you're in charge of uh, dispensing retribution. Sadly, this is actually what sometimes happens in the justice system in general, in the juvenile system uh, in specific. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, before I get into the next statistics, I want to introduce this idea of who is the juvenile offender. And not every, we're not going to have folks go around. I'm not going to have you tell me who the juvenile offender is. But we know through research that when we ask people who the juvenile offender is, who the criminal is, and I ask them to picture that person in their mind, it is more likely to be a black or a brown-faced person that is pictured in their mind. I'm going to show you a pie chart of juvenile arrests throughout the country in 2006. The blue pie piece is white juveniles. You can see here, 71% of juvenile arrests are of white juveniles. Now, there's a couple things that we need to unpack with this statistic. As we are looking at these statistics, this shouldn't be shocking. For any statistic that we're looking at within the United States, whites should be the majority because whites are the majority of people. But so often I think that we forget and we talk about that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a personal frustration of mine, you know, to bring in another topic area. When people start talking about welfare and welfare reform, and there's even some presidential candidates that have said stuff, you know, about uh, the African Americans and the black people that are on welfare. The majority of people in this country that are on welfare are white people because that is the majority within this country. And so looking at this juvenile uh, uh, arrest record, we shouldn't be surprised by this, but yet it flies counter to the stereotype that gets put out there in, the, in this country. Now, there's another thing that we need to unpack with this pie chart, and I'm sure that it stands out to many people, is where are Hispanics? This is where the justice system, the Department of Justice, is both right for being wrong and wrong for being right. Statistics about race are really difficult to report uh, because we all don't use the same definition about what a race is and what an ethnicity is. Now, if you boil down to what Hispanic means, Hispanic is actually not a race. Now, most of us, in how we talk about race, we just choose to use Hispanic as a race, and most uh, researchers do. But it is actually, in all technicality, an ethnicity. And there is a difference between race and ethnicity. The Department of Justice is the only uh, enterprise that I know that understands this reality and chooses to live by it. So therefore, they don't report Hispanics within the racial data. So by definition, they are right. But in the context of us making meaning of these numbers, um, it doesn't do us any good. We need to all coalesce either around you know, using Hispanic as a racial category or using Latina Latino as a racial category because as we're talking about statistics, it's a sad reality in this country that if I can't count you, if we can't count you, then sometimes that means you don't count. We need to be able to show where people are in society in order to be able to advocate appropriately. But moving on beyond the juvenile arrest, this is a breakdown of what some of the different uh, um, uh, categories people are arrested for. You can see the disparity between whites and African Americans on rape, on aggravated assault, on weapons. On Look at driving under the influence. Look at that disparity. It's just incredible. But we know that once uh, someone is arrested, there is still a lot of discretion that is given as to what happens from there. Are they referred to court following arrest? You know, police can choose to do all sorts of things. Maybe they just choose to give you a warning. Maybe they choose to take you to the station, scare you a little bit, and then call your parents. We can see while white juveniles are more likely to be arrested, they are less likely to be referred to court. Children of color are much more likely to be referred to court. And then once referred to court, white children are more likely to receive probation and children of color are more likely to receive secure detention. This researcher chose to find data, uh, chose to collect their own data outside of the Department of Justice, which is why they're able to report data as relates to Hispanics. You know, there's a lot of euphemisms in the um, uh, in the justice system, and secure detention is one of them. I hope everyone understands that secure detention means jail. Um, as a bunch of housing professionals, you might find it just as interesting note, another uh, euphemism. Uh, Cook County Jail, uh, right here in the city of Chicago, if you go to it and you check it out, the sign out in front of it says Cook County Dormitory. You can't make this up, I swear to you, it says Cook County Dormitory. It is jail, but uh, the state of Illinois calls it a dorm. 
Anyway, moving on. <laughs> the, uh, the, the last uh, thing that I wanted to bring up as far as this uh, topic is concerned is this is the only research area where the researchers, the writers, the advocates, and the allies don't talk about children. They talk about juveniles. And how much does that change the tenor of our conversation, how we feel about the conversation? When we talk about juveniles, I think it sets up this uh, you know, pesky juvenile idea, this whole idea of these problem children. What if we stop talking about juvenile justice? What if we talked about children justice? What if we talk about child justice, kid justice? How, often, how much does that change just the feeling of our conversation? It's a, it's a challenge I put out there for all of you to think about in your conversation. Back of the school bus, K-12 education. I'm going to talk a little bit about K-12, but I want to save more time to be able to talk about higher ed because obviously that is our field. We know that there is a, a reading. We know that there is a, a series of gaps uh, relating to testing, whether it is for reading scores, and there's a lot of information in the book about that. I'm not going to spend much time talking about that data, though. Um, there is data in the book about how that when there are more children in class, that class is more likely to comprise more children of color. Uh, uh, and so there's information in the book about that. But as a judicial officer uh, here at DePaul University, I wanted to talk a little bit about discipline. I find uh, the, the conversations on discipline really interesting. As we look at some of the research uh, between whites and African Americans, comparing the total stool, stool school enrollment, and then uh, what happens if a student uh, is more likely to be suspended or expelled. We can see you know, some of the disparities there. But one thing I'll be completely honest with you blew me away when I was doing this research, and it blew me away due to my own ignorance, and that is about corporal punishment. I had no idea that there are 20 states still in the United States where it is perfectly legal for school officials to hit children. I had no idea that this was still the case. And we can see here, uh, when we look at African Americans within those school districts, their total school population, they're much more likely, disproportionately so, to receive corporal punishment uh, when compared to other populations within that school. I think that some people might find it interesting. There's a, a lot of websites out there about how to end corporal punishment of all children, both uh, in the school system and, and without. And that's something that I would advocate for uh, ardently as well. Uh, there's uh, websites out there that chronicle um, all the laws within the United States that outlaw corporal punishment, but also those laws um, worldwide. And there is hundreds of there are hundreds of countries that have outlawed corporal punishment in schools. And a few of those countries are Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Venezuela, and Libya. Countries that have outlawed corporal punishment in schools. I just thought people might find that as an interesting side note. But lastly, the leaky pipeline, access to higher education. I think uh, you know, this was uh, the chapter I was most looking forward to writing, because obviously this is my field of choice. You know, as I often will say to my students, you know, we, we uh, often will say, the more you know, you earn more dough. Uh, and because we know that uh, the more degrees that you earn uh, uh, increases your earning potential. I also like to point out there to uh, all my fellow higher ed professionals, as someone who has a doctorate, it matters greatly what you get your doctorate doctorate in. Uh, a doctorate in education doesn't automatically equal 95K. I'm sorry to uh, you know, burst many people's bubbles out there in case you were wondering. But uh, we know that uh, enrollment has gone nothing but up too. Uh, in 2008, total college enrollment uh, of higher education was uh, just under 20 million, but that enrollment has not been equitable. Uh, for whites, blacks, and Hispanics, it has all gone up, uh, but the increase for uh, white students has, has been higher than anyone else. But as we look at the total enrollment in 2008 uh, of our college uh, demographics, and as we look at this pie chart, this pie chart is actually pretty representative of the United States adult population. This could lead some people to say, look, we've made it. I mean, we've achieved equity here within higher ed. I mean, the, the, the enrollment demographics mirror roughly what the demographics of the US are. There's a couple questions we need to answer, though in order to you know, be able to uh, jump for joy. The first question is, OK, great, they're enrolling. Where are they enrolling? And then two, are they graduating? So let's jump into the first, where they are enrolling. On this screen, I have the 10 most selective institutions in this country, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, MIT, Dartmouth, Brown, Caltech, University of Pennsylvania. These bar charts 
on this screen represent the black and Hispanic enrollment at each one of these institutions. These dashed lines represent the actual demographic in the entire United States adult population for blacks and Hispanics. And as you can see, for not one of these institutions are we reaching the actual enrollment size within that adult population. So we know students of color aren't necessarily enrolling at the most selective institutions. So where are they enrolling? Let's look at the 10 largest community colleges in the United States. This is the exact same setup of a chart with very, very different results. And I don't put this up here to in any way disparage the work that's being done at community colleges. I think community colleges can be a great thing. I say can be because I don't think necessarily right now they are. Only about one-third, only about about 30, uh, about 33 percent or a little bit more of students enrolling in community college will ever graduate or attend or graduate a uh, baccalaureate university or institution. And so I think we need to get that number up if we want to, you know, really start to uh, see community colleges prosper. But still, we are seeing here the hierarchy within higher ed. And we all might not like to talk about it, but it exists that the degree from Harvard University matters a lot more in the marketplace than the degree from a lot of other institutions. And especially for African American and Hispanic children, they are not gaining access to those most selective institutions. There's one other segment of society, one other segment of higher education, where uh, students of color are more likely to enroll. And that is for-profit education. If that will eventually come up on the screen, there we go, for-profit education. I want you to think for a minute about the largest for-profit school in the country. It is the University of Phoenix. I want you just to, on your own here for a moment, I'm not going to have you report out. I often, when I'm doing this in person with people, I like to play a little Price is Right style guessing game of how many students are enrolled within the University of Phoenix. How, what is their total enrollment? Very often when I'll do this, I'll get people shout out 50,000. 75,000. I'll even give people a shout out 100,000, 150,000, maybe 200,000. 477,486. That is the total enrollment of the University of Phoenix in 2009. Those 10 most selective institutions that I had up on the screen before are right here, 141,000 and change. Those 10 largest community colleges I had up before, adding them all together is 406,000 and change. University of Phoenix alone is 477. University of Phoenix, is, they tout as one of their uh, uh, things to be proud of that 30% of their institution is of African American students. And I don't have this up here again to outright disparage what the University of Phoenix is. I think for-profit education has come under a lot of scrutiny, and it should. There have been a lot of problems in for-profit education, a lot, of, a lot of students that have been taken advantage of along the way, and there's a lot of exposés and reports about that. But again, as we talk about this hierarchy within higher education, if students of color are, more, are the most likely to enroll in community colleges and then also for-profit colleges that aren't necessarily preparing them for careers out there in the, in the field, how can we really credit that as advancement? So those are some critical questions I think we need to be left with. So when we looked at that enrollment uh, slide before of you know, uh, asking the question of where people are enrolling, we can see there is not equity in where people are enrolling. We also know in answering the second question, that something happens along the way in higher education. And everyone who starts out doesn't necessarily graduate. When we looked at the enrollment slide before, it was about 63% of enrollment was of white uh, students. But white students are walking away with 76% of the bachelor's degrees. So what is happening along the way throughout higher education? And what is our responsibility of the people on this phone in, uh, in that equity-based conversation? I think it's really important, before we open it up to questions, that uh, we talk about next steps. We talk about what we can do with this information and how we can conceptualize ourselves as social change agents. I think so often diversity and social justice educators will just present a problem and then walk away and say, hey, good luck. Hope you can figure that out. I think that we need to talk a little bit about how we can view ourselves as a social change agent. So you know, in ending the book, I included some of that information. You know, I'm sure there are people that have seen um, uh, figures like this before where, you know, there's a social change agent in the center and they have all these different levels of influence in their life. And obviously, um, those closest to us are the ones that we have the most ability to impact. 
Now, my experience working with college students especially, uh, and maybe it resonates with some of you, is that when they first start as a social change agent in their college experience, where do they want to present, uh, present the change? They want to present it at the farthest ring out possible. I want to change the world. I want to change the city. And that's great. I think that it's wonderful to have that fire. I don't know if it's necessarily realistic. What would our society look like if all of us affected those locuses of control that are the closest to us? What kind of systemic effect could that have? And this is something that when I still do training with RAs right now, I tell them, you have 50 residents on your floor. What kind of impact can you have there? And how can that extend on beyond you know, to the campus once that's felt? One thing that we often forget, though, that when we're working as a social change agent is that we're not working alone. We need to look at how are we developing community along the way. Because it is community that is going to help us reach those farthest rings from us as social change agents. As an example of this, I use the example of Dr. King as an amazing social change agent. And for his levels of influence, I compressed them closer together because, of course, he was someone who had the ability to change cities, to change the entire nation. But in my opinion, sometimes we give leaders way too much credit for what is earned. And I don't mean that, again, to besmirch in any way the work that Dr. King did. But the only reason why he was able to create such change was because he worked in an exceptionally large and vibrant community. It wasn't just one person. It was an entire community that created that change. When we think about the I Have a Dream speech, and when we think about those beautiful words said by the man at the microphone, too often we focus on the man at the microphone. What makes this moment beautiful is not him. What makes it beautiful is the thousands of people that were gathered to listen to him. That, those people are the reason we know about the I Have a Dream speech today. They are the ones that made that to be a historical moment, not the man at the microphone. And so a challenge I have when we talk about whether it's color by number or whatever our vantage point is in being a social change agent, it's not enough to know what you stand for. You also need to know who you stand with. Because if you're not standing with anybody, then you're not working with and for justice. Social justice is a fundamentally community-based driven um, ideology. And we need to be constantly challenging ourselves again on developing that community. And it's, and, it, and it's great to be able to have this opportunity here in order to delve into that community further. As far as some other resources, uh, in the book I have at the end of every chapter a next steps for the reader section. Uh, it provides some potential projects that people could do in order to enhance their own learning and also uh, just some other information, informative websites out there and other resources to extend your own learning. You know, For example, one I'll give you here on the phone. If that environmental justice conversation was something that was interesting to you, um, you know, there, is a, there is a tool on the internet called EnviroMapper. If you go to Google and you put in EnviroMapper, it, the, the website will come up. It's an ETA website, and you can put in your zip code, and it'll pull up the map, and then you could look at whatever hazardous waste, Superfund sites, toxic chemicals, air pollution, water pollution are pre present in your community, and then using some of the tools on the site, you can overlay where are the schools, where are the churches, where are the hospitals. And so you can see how this affects your community and other communities close to you. It can be a really interesting, it can also be really scary, but it can be a really interesting uh, endeavor for people to, to take a look at. So that next steps for the reader is, a, is, a, is an important tool, I think. And then also, I've created a, a video for every chapter in the book in order to talk through some of the materials with this. And it could be a way just to help spark some conversation and share some of this material with people uh, that weren't able to join us for this webinar. So those, those uh, videos are always free up on my website on YouTube, uh, and please feel free to use those in any way uh, that uh, you see fit. So that's a, you know, a bit of uh, you know, my conversation about color by number. I, I look forward to hearing about any questions, whether these questions help you in any way with uh, 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 some of your reflection um, or just any of your other individual questions. Well, thank you, Art. Uh, right now we are taking questions, so if anyone has questions for the presenter today, please submit them now. Um, at this time, I have not received any questions, so we will pause for just another moment um, to allow people to submit those in case you have some. So we'll just hang tight for about another 30 seconds or a minute here and see what we get. I'll be disappointed if there's no questions. Come on.
Yeah, right, as well, you're thinking about questions, and as you're thinking about, you know, how, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, while we wait for questions, did you want to talk about um, how to obtain a copy of the book that you were referencing? Sure. So, I mean, you can get a copy just about anywhere on the, uh, uh, and here's the, oh, this is my contact information, rather. Uh, but uh, here's the cover again. Um, uh, Stylus Publ is the publisher, and Stylus is offering a 20% uh, discount uh, associated with this webinar. You just need to go to the Stylus website and uh, use the code color N, all one word is color N, uh, and receive a 20% discount. Um, I was really excited for those of you that are um, familiar with social justice and diversity education. Um, Tim Wise was able to write the um, uh, foreword to this book, which was a great honor to me. I mean, he's definitely someone that I've looked up to in the field. And so I appreciated uh, uh, him including the foreword uh, with the book. But you can also get it on Amazon or just about anywhere else, too. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple yeah, questions whether, that have come in. It, great. Um, if anybody else has questions, please continue to submit those now. Once we reach the end of the questions that we have here, that will probably be the conclusion of our webinar. So I'll just go uh, with the first one here. Thanks to Alexandria White from Southern Illinois Edwardsville for submitting this question. She says, I specifically work with families on campus. There are a total of 45 families who live in apartments on campus. Many of the parents lack time to participate in community activities. What are some suggestions to engage the parents? To engage the parents in, in this conversation, I mean, I think specifically, I mean, I think some of that environmental justice conversation is, is important because you can tie it specifically to their community that they either live in there with you now at Southern or where they're from originally. Uh, I mean, anything that we can do to try and uh, make sure that this forms as a connection point for them. Um, I have found that to be one of the easiest mechanisms in, and it's one that, uh, unfortunately, people know too few, of, uh, too little about. And so I, I would use that as a resource. Um, you know, if we're looking at families too, we're also looking at school systems. Uh, what information out is out there about the school system to look at? You know, test score gaps about you know um, what the racial breakdown is of different school systems. Um, and and one last one I would put out there, and how it kind of bridges both of those conversations is. Uh, I was really shocked to learn uh, through this process um, the amount of environmental just and the envir amount of environmental damage that is done and how that affects children based upon how schools are cleaned. Um, very often, schools are obviously you know, especially if we're talking about public schools, um, they have processes they have to go through in how they buy and pay for cleaning materials, and usually has to go to the lowest bidder. And if we go to the lowest bidder, that means they were typically using the the most damaging and harmful chemicals. And what kind of effect that is half, uh, having on children as uh, year after year, day after day, um, the school is being cleaned with these chemicals, and they are breathing them in, or sometimes even ingesting them, uh, just through you know how kids are. You know they touch everything and they put their hands in their mouth. Um, you know, that puts those chemicals into their body. Thank you, Art, um, and thank you, Alexandria, for submitting that question. This will be our last call for questions, and we do have one more that came in um, while we were waiting. Thank you to Barbara at Concordia University in Wisconsin. Art, during your research, what surprised you about your hometown of Chicago? Um, you know, sadly, well, okay, I, I'll, I'll give you one thing that surprised me, um, and, and uh, it's something that's unfortunately not included in the book. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, when you write a book, you know, there, there's tough choices you need to make because, you know, there's a, a page number you need to hit, and so you can't, you can't include every single thing that you find. I did a lot of research on undocumented children, and, um, and I, wasn't, I wasn't able to include much of it in the book. Um, but I did a lot of research as it relates to Chicago, and I think that as we talk about un, you know, undocumented people in general and children in specific, uh, very often we get the uh, image in our head, again, of a brown-faced person, specifically someone who's Mexican. And while that might be um, the largest percentage of people who are undocumented, there are other large undocumented populations in different pockets in the city. 20% of the undocumented population for children in the city of Chicago are Polish. 
We don't often talk about this though because, and it's kind of a, it's kind of something that's used in jest in Chicago, but it's actually true the statistics that the only place in the world with more Polish citizens outside of Chicago is Warsaw, Poland. Chicago has the highest number of Polish citizens, and then therefore we have a high percentage of uh, Polish in, uh, individuals here who are undocumented. Um, one in five in the city of Chicago, but it doesn't enter into the conversation. We keep the conversation centered solely on race, so solely on Mexico and Mexicans, and I think that it, it doesn't do justice to the wider conversation. Thank you. Last question for the presentation today. This one comes to us from Alexandria, again, from SIU Edwardsville. Um, she writes, uh, I read Savage Inequalities by John Kozal, and since I work close to East St. Louis, I see many of the educational and environmental disparities. What do you think about food deserts in regards to environmental justice? And so another thing that uh, you know I wasn't able to go into enough detail about that I would love to, um, we don't talk about the effect that nutrition has, and even having access to nutrition, we can, uh, or you know, uh, and, and how that affects, you know, even things from obesity to, you know, diabetes, and and this is where we talk about all those interconnections. And so I appreciate you bringing this up. Uh, anything you read by Jonathan Kozel is always going to be fantastic. So I would recommend you read, you know, all of his books. Um, I, I think that it is such a systemic issue that we need to be able to have government be able to intercede to bring businesses to neighborhoods to sell food that is nutritious but this is what some this is an idea that can run counter to the idea of capitalism though of, of how things work um, it's something that I, I, honestly we struggle with even here at DePaul um, I have a student food pantry on campus because I have such a high number of students who suffer from food insecurity. 20% of DePaul students are below the federal poverty limit. And so we are constantly challenging ourselves on not only giving the food to them that is donated, because very often people donate food that they don't want, and the food that they don't want isn't very nutritious, but how we can go out and buy food for them that will actually be uh, beneficial to them. So you're touching on an area that I wish I had more time to go into in this conversation, but is absolutely crucial. Uh, your nutrition and access to food impacts your health, and then your health is impacted on your ability to uh, obtain health insurance and get access to doctors. It affects you in being able to go to school and then ultimately into higher ed. All of these are interconnected. All right, do we have time for one last question that came in? It uh, ties back to higher ed here. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, Aaron Hill from NIU asks, um, I'm wondering how research for this book has impacted disciplinary conversations that you've had with your students. It has, uh, and, and even before then, I mean, I think um, I actually did a, a, a blog post uh, not too long ago for the Commission of Social Justice Education at, at, for uh, ACPA, talking about social justice and the conduct process. Uh, I've long advocated for, and I think that many institutions do this, but if, if yours don't, I would, I, would, I would have you look at it, is that we need to look at our judicial systems and break down the numbers every single year uh, based on racial demographics, gender, or whatever other demographics you need to divide them out on to be able to see if there is a disparity um, and be able to ask some critical questions. And so doing this book uh, further you know, put that into my mind. It actually informed me writing that blog post for the CSJE. Um, it's, it's difficult, though, and, and what I really appreciate about this question, too, is that it challenges us to think about this through the lens of we are part of the problem. I think that so often we talk about this idea of justice and diversity, and we're all great about talking about it, but not talk about the part that we own in this. We are a part of the academy. We are a part of higher education. We are a part of that schism in society that says you're going to be allowed to grant access to middle class life, and then you're not going to be able to, or at least not be able to as easily because you can't get into higher ed. Uh, we are a part of that system, and, and the conduct process is a crucial part of that for many of our students. And so I think that we need to look very critically at, at our data to see what it is telling us and then ask some of those training related questions of, you know, are there students that are more likely to get flagged uh, for judicial uh, notification for some things that would be a judgment call? You know, when I looked at some of the school data, um, African American children in K-12 were more likely to be flagged for things like disrespect or incivility 
and white children are more likely to be flagged for tardiness or smoking. Well, one of those, one set of those topics are subjective, and another set of those are objective. If you were tardy or if you were smoking, that's pretty black and white. We know if you were doing it or you didn't. Whereas disrespect and incivility, what kind of mechanism are people using in order to make a decision as to whether or not you were disrespectful or, uh, or uncivil? Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's an important question that has to factor into our training and also our data collection. Great. Thank you so much, Art. This presentation has been very informative. I want to also thank the Inclusion and Equity Committee for reaching out to Art to set this up. Um, Art, did you have any closing remarks or anything to wrap up? No, I appreciate everyone uh, being involved in the conversation. If you ever have any individual questions or you want some more information, please feel free to contact me. I have a Facebook group set up for Color by Number as well. Feel free to jump on there. Uh, there's, you know, it's always a good place for conversation. Uh, but again, I just appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know that it's a, a busy time. And, uh, and, and I was thinking today, too, you know, I'm talking to all the people that didn't go to uh, NASPA. So I, uh, I, I appreciate you uh, joining for this opportunity, uh, even though we're not uh, down hanging out with Mickey Mouse. Well, thanks again, everyone. Um, I will work to get this presentation posted on, on our website, as well as our YouTube channel, which is Glacujo. Um, so stay tuned there if you'd like the replay or if you'd like to send it to anybody. Um, also, you'll get an email follow-up as the results of this session today with a code for the discount if you wanted to purchase a copy of the book. And it'll have a brief questionnaire if you wouldn't mind submitting your feedback on today's session. It should take you no more than a minute or two. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.